Our freedoms are not free. That this is the price our guys and our women paid for our freedoms. That it didn't come without sacrifice and many lives were lost as a result of it. So this plane is also a testimony to those who lost their lives as well as those who came home and should be a permanent reminder to us that they fought for our freedoms and we shouldn't take it for granted. I'm from South Plainfield, New Jersey. I've been here nine times. This is actually my ninth trip. And I came out here to honor my father and his crew who served with Jimmy Stewart in World War II. And of course to honor the Memphis Belle and its unveiling. For a crew to finish 25 missions was a rare thing. And my father's crew was assigned 25 missions at the beginning of their tour of duty. But in February of 1944, their missions were upped to 30 missions. And this was because they were gaining air superiority with our P-51 Mustangs. So what he thought was going to be 25 turned out to be 30. And he was one of only three crews in his squadron to finish their tour of duty. The rest were shot down, killed, taken prisoner, uh, etc. He said they really stuck to their crew as far as friendships went. He had a couple of other friends on other crews. In fact, he watched one of them get shot down on a big week mission in February of 44. He watched a tail gunner trapped in a turret that was shot off a of B-24. The guy waved goodbye to my father as he was going down. And that was one of their most dangerous missions as well. So that, that mission was actually April 12, 1944. And he flew with Jimmy Stewart on several missions from December of 43, when they flew their first mission to Kiel, Germany. And Jimmy Stewart stayed with them till the end of March of 44, when he was transferred to another bomb group. But my father said the way you see him in the movies is exactly how he was in real life. Down to earth, regular guy. And he flew the most dangerous missions of the war. The 445th Airlift Wing does have its roots in the 445th Bomb Group, which was activated in World War II. And my father, along with Jimmy Stewart and their, their squadron, was attached to the 445th Bomb Group. And the current designation is with a military airlift wing, which is primarily cargo, whereas in World War II it was a bombardment group, a heavy bomb group. And the ironic thing is I served in the military airlift wing as well at McGuire Air Force Base when I was in the service. So there's a connection there. Plus this museum has a 445th airlift wing C-141. And I flew in C-141s when I was in the Air Force back in the mid-1980s. So there's an interesting connection there. I was in the ground support unit. We used to service the 141s. And then on some missions we would get on the plane with them and we would fly with them. And I would do TDYs out here to Wright-Patterson or Wisconsin or Georgia, all over the, the eastern half of the U.S. So I spent quite a bit of time in the 141s. Uh, one of the reasons I'm here as well is I'm currently researching and writing for my book, Daylight Raiders. Uh, this book has been seven years in the making. I've traveled to Europe four times. I've been across the U.S. at least 20 times, retracing my father's footsteps and flight paths for this story of his entire life with the crux of it being World War II. So I hope to release this within the next year, maybe two years tops, and hopefully we'll see it here at the U.S. Air Force Museum. It has actually been a great blessing. I've been to the uh, National Archives seven times. They have all of his missions in folders there. So I have scanned 6,000 documents, which I'm currently going through. I've contacted all of his crew members' families, and the last surviving crew member lives here in Springfield, Ohio. His name is George Snook. He comes here sometimes. He's 97 years old, and he was the top turret gunner. So he helped me do a lot of the research for this book, and I interviewed him over 100 times on the phone, and this is my ninth trip out here to see him face to face. So when I come to the museum, I visit his combat buddy who lives in Springfield. It's a double blessing. What's amazing about the Memphis Belle is that its crew was one of the first crews in the U.S. 8th Air Force to finish 25 combat missions. And that was almost an impossibility in mid-1943. Now at the time this crew was flying, my father was in training in the States. So he heard about this crew finishing their 25 missions. So it gave them a glimmer of hope that if they were to go to the European theater, they might have a chance of survival. Now, it's interesting, the position of the plane, you could see it's in a wheels-up position. The gear is up, and the bomb bay doors are open. 
that's signifying that it's on a bomb run and it has just dropped the bombs. So it's showing that it's in its active position where it would have been over the bomb run. And my father said that was the toughest part of the mission because the uh, bombardier was in charge of flying the plane at that point and they could not move to take evasive action. That meant they had to keep a straight course from the initial point through the bomb run and they were sitting ducks with the German flak gunners. And my father said it was like running the gauntlet. Once you were on that bomb run, which could last three to five minutes, you couldn't shoot back at flak. So this position signifies the most dangerous part of the mission. And so for these guys to survive 25 of these missions, that's quite a testimony to the crew and to the plane itself. What made it really personal was looking at the personal items that these men brought home from the war. To know that they actually wore these items, whether it was the dog tags or the insignia, or even the metal uh, protective eyewear, which I had not seen before. I've seen the goggles that are regular ones my father wore, but to see the metal plated goggles for the pilot to wear to protect him from flak, that was unique. I had not seen that before. So the whole display of all their personal items makes it very personal, personable and enjoyable to see and realize, wow, these guys actually carried this into battle. One of the reasons I myself come here and recommend that others come here, you can't really get a whole lot from pictures as you can in person, seeing it in three-dimensional uh, space. When you could see it up front and close and actually get near enough to almost touch it, you feel like you're touching part of history. And to know that this machine was so personalized by these men that when you see it in person, it's almost like seeing a person himself. And that's the connection. There's the human aspect to actually come here and see it physically does more justice to them and it also honors them as well. And it makes you feel like you're reaching out and touching part of American history which is quickly being lost on many levels, but it's being well preserved here at the museum. My first book is Nine Yanks and a Jerk. This grew out of Daylight Raiders because as I discovered the history of this plane called Nine Yanks and a Jerk, it was flown by my father, Henry J. Culver, and his crew as they were Jimmy Stewart's wingman on this mission to bomb Nuremberg, Germany on February 25th, 1944. That was the last mission of the Big Week missions, which were the big daylight raids against German aviation industry targets. So my father's crew took an 88 shell right midship, and it didn't explode. It knocked out their hydraulic system and their communication system, and it knocked debris out a hole it blew behind a pilot's seat the debris went over the wing and ripped the machine gun out of my father's hands while he was firing at an enemy plane. It ricocheted off the pilot's armor plating, which was a half inch thick. And if it weren't for that armor plating, the pilot would have been killed by the exiting shell. And the top turret gunner, George, always said to me, the, the shell was a dud made by slave labor, otherwise it would have been splattered all over uh, Germany at that point. So they made it back to their base in England. They shot emergency flares. They had to do a crash landing. They put the nose gear down, but they couldn't get it locked. So the, the pilot had to drag the tail with my father and most of the crew weighing the tail down. Now the B-24 is not a tail dragger like the B-17. So because they couldn't get the nose wheel to lock, they said, go easy on it when you put the nose down. Well, when they put the nose down at the end of the runway, it collapsed and they skid off into the end of the field. And all the guys in the back seesawed and hit the roof, including my father. They all come out okay, a little banged up. The pilot gashed his forehead on the uh, control panel. They all get out of the plane. My father gets out of the back first. The other guys get out the front. The first guy running across the airfield is Jimmy Stewart to come and meet them. And the first guy he meets is my father. My father just lit, just lit up a freshly lit cigarette and he's shaking like a leaf. And he, Stewart's looking at him with a smirk on his face and he says, is everyone okay, Sergeant? My father said, we're all okay, sir, just a little shaken up. So Stewart says, well, where's Mac, the pilot? Because they were drinking buddies. And my father with a shaking cigarette in his hand points to the other side of the ship where Mac was. So he walks with Stewart to the other side of the plane Stewart looks at Mac and Mac looks at Stewart and Stewart says to the pilot, 
When I saw that hole in the side of the ship, I thought they got you. And he gave him a hug. And the two of them were supposed to go to a BBC broadcast that night in London, and they never made it. Mac and Stewart and the other officers got so bombed that night, they slept it off in a hospital in hospital beds that night. It's a true story. So that's one of many stories about the history of this plane, including the fact that Jimmy Stewart flew in it himself on previous missions. So that book's uh, it's available online, and uh, that's the first book I wrote. It's done very well. And because your dad made it, you're here. That's right. I would not be here if my father had not survived those 30 missions. And I, I, he always said it was by the grace of God and their skill and a little bit of luck. <laughs>